And welcome to our broadcast, and thank you so much for joining us. You know, one of the things that we try to tell stories from around the world and stories that you're not even f familiar with. And today, um, uh, Rachel Spivak, uh, who uh, founded the Raquel Care, Care Agency, and her son Aaron Spivak, who's the co-founder of Hush Blankets. You know, so many people have heard of Hush Blankets. You know, I, it was just, um, I, I find it amazing. They're entrepreneurs, and they are both where? In Toronto? Yep. Yeah, in Toronto. Yeah. Yes, in Toronto, Canada. So, so uh, Rachel, you are the you are the sort of the progenitor of that household. You are the entrepreneur uh, extraordinaire. Talk about uh, Raquel's um, care and the care agency, and also how it was founded. How I started? Yes. It's like, um, I remember I'm pregnant with Erin. It's 30 years ago. And I'm looking for myself for help. I'm after a car accident, then I'm pregnant, and I'm looking for somebody for help. And I find one of the nice lady, and she started to work with us, and actually she worked with us for 12 years. And um, then all my friends and everyone start to ask me, oh my God, how you find it? How you find it? I said, okay, give me to see. Maybe I, maybe I can help you. I can find something for you. And right away I find one for my best friend and for my sister and for another one, another one. And then everybody start to talk and that's how it starts. To explain to us what you found, because you needed um, care to help you raise your son, Aaron. Uh, explain in detail exactly what you found and because obviously what you found worked for what you were looking for and it worked so uh, well others in the neighborhood wanted the same. The I find, I don't know if like that, but I have a lot of girls that came and then I interview and I saw the girls, I saw her heart and I saw we talking and the connection right away. Maybe I have something that I can choose or right away I have with her connection and, um, but I be with her home. I teach her everything. I don't ex expect her right away to be superstar. It's take time until um, I teach them. I teach them very well and I'm with them home. And this time I'm pregnant. And um, I show her everything, I teach everything. And she became part of the family. That's the most important. You know, Aaron, you are the, uh, the polished talker of the family. I mean, obviously. And, you know, you know your mother in a, the caregiving industry, which is huge in, in the world today, caregiving, um, particularly given the stage of life that you find some of these people in, they really need someone who has the heart, has the soul, selfless to take care of people who are in need. Talk about the unique care services that your mother found that set her apart from other caregiving agencies. I think one thing that I learned as a kid, just watching her, you know, operate, you know, as, a, as an immigrant who didn't really speak the language, you know, didn't read English, didn't really write English, but she clearly found that everyone in our community and people that she met needed help but the biggest issue was it was hard to trust someone to just come into your house you know raise your children with you cook for you it was kind of a scary thing it's like oh, it's like what if it doesn't work out and you know what i noticed that she did so well is she cared so much she valued just every single placement every single match you know match made in heaven where she would take a family and match them with a, a potential caregiver some of them would live in these people's houses for 10, 15 years, raise their kids with them, go to graduations, really become a part of the family. So for me, I, like growing up and watching how much she cared about every single customer, every single relationship was the, actually the foundation for me <clears throat> as I get into products to create things that not only work from financially in business, but actually make a difference when they go into people's homes. And a lot of people didn't value it, but my mom would lose you know, sleep every night trying to make the perfect pair and get people the right match because she knew that it could change the trajectory of their family. Talk about, 
um, how that business grew exponentially and how it changed your mother traveling abroad and how many people were coming in a month. I mean, I just found uh, it to be just an amazing story. Yeah, I mean, you know, when I was 13, I never really understood it. And now, you know, I'm 29 years later and I got to really reflect on, you know, how amazing of a business it was. And what made it so special was that she would meet and get to know the girls, the caregivers that were coming in from all over the world. And she would essentially work like a matchmaker to make sure if someone came to them and they had a special need in their house or they wanted, you know, a specific type of person to be with their family. A lot of people in the space were working just as brokers. You know, they'd say, oh, you want a caregiver? No problem. I'll find someone that wants to be a caregiver. I'll complete the application for you and I hope it works out. And then they would, they would get paid. My mom found a way where she would spend an enormous amount of time vetting people, not to decide whether they can come or not, but to make sure they landed in the right home. And so that when they landed, you know, in Canada, they would be placed, they would be taught, they would be trained, uh, they would feel safe. The whole, the whole thing is very scary. A random person in a random person's home that you kind of just met online. And she would vet the entire process and put so much effort and love into it it was magnificent to the point where everyone in the community where we grew up and pretty much all of Toronto was only coming to my mom like in our living room because they didn't trust any other service to place someone in their house and work with their kids and work with their family. Rachel, how important is caregiving? Because obviously this is something that you had no training, no background for. You just needed help with raising your newborn, um, what, what, is, what is it that people can learn, particularly for those who think that you have to have certain skills or certain education, certain experiences to create a multi-million dollar business? What's, what was that little extra that made you extraordinary? I think you have to work a lot, a lot with your heart. It's very, very important. You cannot just give a match, you have to understand, meet the girls, see how she is, and then you meet the client. I have to meet the client. I used to meet the family. I used to listen to them and then try to match, match each one of them. It's not just, okay, I have girls, you need somebody, okay, take the girls. No, I go to the family and I hear what's, if it's old people, what's the problem? How's the day work? What she's, what if she needs for the night? What's the problem with eating? If the girls know what to do for her? And a lot of time, if the girl don't understand because they're coming from place, they don't know nothing about our food. They don't know. I remember one of the girls, I give her lettuce and she cooked the lettuce. And I say, what is that salad? She said, no, I don't know what is it. I never saw stuff like that. Then I realized in the time, that I fly there to meet them and eat and see how they're living and come here. And they don't even know they're in the shop to see the client and they see the kids. And it's really big to culture. It's mean, and you need to come in to connect both of them. It's a lot of work. Some days I didn't even sleep just to worry about the girls. And what I used to do, they bring the girls ab aboard I didn't put her right away with the client because I say, what's happened if she's sick the first two, three days? What's happened? They have baby. They have kids. I always make sure that she go to the family, that she understand our fridge, she understand our product, she understand the, our fruit. They don't see all the fruit. And if she go to the kosher family, I need to teach her what it mean, milk and meat, or different culture. It's in, it's a lot of work just take someone from different world and put it in the house. That's why all the client trust me. They know that I going to give it to them and the client don't have patience to teach. They don't have, they won't try to wear Mary Poppins. Pop, come to your house. She know everything about Canada. She know about the kids here. It's different mentality completely. It's mean it's a lot of work. Talk about at the, at the heart of your business. How many girls did you have at one time coming in every month? Oh, but it's every every day different, different. It can be one month, 20, 30. It's depend. 
Talk, it's really depends talk, because you don't know you don't know how they come in. It's depend how they release the visa. Well, it's they say, oh, we don't know when they release. Then one day they tell, oh, they have released the visa. It's nothing to do with us. You can wait for the girls, and then they say, oh, I'm sorry, in the embassy, it's take another couple of months. So, so you, you had to, you had to work with that process. Talk about the importance, though, of caregiving, the difference that makes in families today. Because caregiving, no matter where you are, is universal across the world. It's very, well, I just, one second, I want to say something. It's, I see what's going on now, because I have mother right now, they need caregiver. And I'm going there. I try to go to the company and talk to them. Oh my God. I say, it's, they don't care. The people they're putting replacement, the girl, they don't care. You just put her there. And there's things they did business. I didn't look about this. I didn't look just to do business. I used to go sometime to the client and take the girls with the old lady and sit with her all day. And if I need in the night to be, because she said the lady wake up 10 times. I said, okay, I come tonight, I sit with you and we'll see what's going on. Then be close, show the girls that she's not alone and show the client they're not alone. It's in its take a lot. I'm not, I didn't do it just business. Here is the girls, take the girls and that's it. No, I need to understand both of sides before I do the matchmaking. And it's, you know what? I always catch 90%. Hardly the girls left the job. I always exactly. Just if I, but why? Because before that I know the girls, I meet her in Hong Kong or any country. I know the personality and then I make myself, that I go back and meet the client, see how I can match. It's very, very important job. Um, and I know it because you have to, also you need to know the client. They have to treat the girls like part of the family. I have three, four caregiver in my own house, 12 years, 10 years, nine years, eight years. I never change because I always show them the part of our family and I teach her and it's okay if you do mistake. You're not like employee and employee in your house. The minute she's in your house, she's part of family. And that's what I try also to educate the client. It's hard. But what I find out right now, whenever I go in the street, some people steal or they're calling the, the kids, they have nanny for me. Oh, please, do you have you? Today it's not the same. It's not the same. It's straight business. Before you more like, you have to put a lot of effort to succeed in the communication. It's Rachel, very, very, it's not an easy job. Right, a fascinating story. You know, when we come back, we're going to continue with Rachel, but we're going to also talk about her son, how he discovered his entrepreneur gene, gene uh, with hush blankets. I mean, they revolutionized the industry. It went from a $4,000 investment to selling the company for $48 million. Just unbelievable. We'll be back. Don't go away. So I must tell you, um, you know, Rachel, I know you hear this often that you look like a younger Raquel Welch. I know you've probably heard that before. Yes, no question. This is a compliment. Thank you. Yes, this is true. But Aaron, your son, uh, you know, I was not really that familiar with Hush Blanket, but guess what? Everybody else was. <laughs> Everybody else was familiar with Hush Blanket. It's a worldly product. So Aaron, you gotta tell us, how did you come up with this idea for hush blankets, and what did what need you need did you see in the market that you aim to fulfill? Well, you know, it was very funny. I met my co-founder at a bar. We were at a charity event, and uh, we were just talking about business and stuff. And I knew nothing about selling online. You know, I didn't know how to do it. I didn't understand it. 
And he told me, he's like, you know, Aaron, if we can find a product, we can sell it to the world from one spot. And I was like, okay. And we started doing a lot of research and he came to me and he said, I remember at a time I was volunteering at a camp for children with various different special needs. And I went into this stimulation room, room that had, you know, for the kids to go and relax, if they were panicking, if they wanted to sleep. He said, they had this like weighted device, dude. And I would go in there and I'd put it on my chest and I'd have the deepest sleep possible. But I wish it was big. I wish it could come to my bed. He's like, but it was designed for these kids. And I was like, well, you know, adults have anxiety, insomnia, stress, trouble sleeping, difficult days. Why has no one created one for adults? And we went online and we found there was a few that like created some type of weighted blanket online. We obviously purchased them. And the second they arrived, within five minutes, I look at him, I said, these are terrible. They won't wash well. They, they don't cover my full body. When I turn the weight inside, like little beads sounds like a rain stick. They look kind of ugly. And I was like, you know, we could, there's a need for this. And he's like, well, how do you know there's a need? And we did some research and we found that there was 300,000 people every single month searching for weighted blankets, uh, blankets for anxiety, blankets for stress, blankets for insomnia. And we knew, I said, if we can create a product that works, and solves this problem, we will be able to take over the world. At least that's the way we felt. So in January of 2018, we launched the first ever Hush Blanket, which was a 15 pound single size blanket. Month after month, we sold you know, 30,000, 60,000. We, we were, uh, had a six month back order. You know, we thought we made it. We were like, we did it, we did it, it was over. Like we, we hit it. We were Googling all these fancy cars and we thought we finally made it. And then the summer hit. In Toronto, that's when it becomes hot, 30, 30 degrees, so like 80, 90 uh, Fahrenheit. And nobody bought. It was done. Like we went from selling all these blankets to zero. And it was at a point where my co-founder called me and said, Aaron, I think we need to uh, shut this down. It looks like we have a seasonal business. They only want to buy it in the winter. And, uh, you know, my mom always taught me to uh, just find another way. And, you know, if we went with a challenge. So I said, hey, before we give up, I'm going to call like 2,000 customers today. I'm going to call every single one of them and ask them why they're not going to buy this thing right now. And after about 600 calls, spent a full month doing this, every single person said the same thing. They said, Aaron, it is so hot. I'm sweating. I'm sweating more than I've ever sweat before. So I put this big, heavy blanket in the closet. And in the winter, I'll pull it out again. And it was a light bulb moment for us where we said, everybody wants that deep touch pressure stimulation, that feeling of a hug but nobody wants to sweat. So what if we made a weighted blanket that was cooling, something no one's ever done before? And we spent a few months developing a fabric, fabric that we uh, developed with some incredible partners in Israel to help us weave uh, uh, the fabric in a different way to actually make people feel cool and not sweat. And we launched that just a year later in 2019. The business went from a couple hundred grand to a $10 million business overnight. And it went to a $48 million business in just I think it was 36 more months to the point where we essentially took over the world with our cooling fabric. And since then, we've done sheets, pillows, mattresses, everything infused with our iced fabric. And it has been a really incredible journey to go from, yeah, just $4,000 to $48 million in, in just 48 months. And that doesn't happen too often. You know, Rachel, I mean, obviously, y your son an apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I mean, your your entrepreneurship, where you just started from scratch, look at what it has inspired your son to create. And and also, he gave a needed, a necessary item, um, something to the marketplace that was missing. Talk about being a mother and uh, with with your children, and talk about what is it that parents need to do in the household where it's less dependency on government, but you inspire your children to become entrepreneurs, to fulfill a need in the marketplace. I don't know if I did something to, to show them. I think it's my natural. They see it every day, that's my mom. And five of them, I have five boys, and each one of them, each one of them is like that, and it's, um, I show them that I work very, very hard. And I always tell them, don't, I don't know how to say it in English, good, don't scare from to be scared. Don't ever be scared to be scared. Just do it. Believe yourself. It's okay to fail. 
and continue. And everything has to come in hard work. Nothing come easy. That's the way I, I, I grew up with 13 brother and sister. Nothing came for me easy. It's mean you have to do it. And they ever, they used to be young and they went to sell a cookie. I did for them bag of cookie and we went to the street and they sell. They want to clean window, they're young, no problem. We buy the ladder or this, we did it. The ever business they want to do, we need to do tied t-shirt, we did it. Uh, I did the cooking from the house and I sell cookie, I sell jewelry, I sell, I always show them we can do it. It's very important to tell them. And if you fall, we are here. It's very important to show your kids. First of all, you have to show your kids example. It's hundred percent. Our our uh, Mila, it's our kids and the kids they see the parents. People think it's not, but yes, people. Sometimes my kids say stuff. They say what? How they know that? How they watch me? How they know everything? Everything they knows and everything they watch. And it's very important to show them the example and say, yes, you can do it. You want to do something? Even I think that it's not going to be exactly, yes, do it. And they show me, let me going from let me, business, to business to business. Let me interrupt you uh, a minute here, Rachel. Talk about the fact that not only did you set the example, but people watching the show today will probably think that you grew up in a multi-million dollar home with wealthy parents. You just mentioned you had 13 brothers and sisters, but you actually grew up poor, struggled, yes. had nothing. Everything you built, you were the first generation of wealth. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I came from a family of uh, 13 brothers, sister. Um, it's very, very hard. I always tell everyone from six years old or seven years old, I have to come from grade one or grade two, and I know exactly what I have to work in the house. I have to do my job. And uh, I have to ask in the evening where I'm sleeping today, in the bed or in the mattress in the floor. Um, it's nothing you get. They ever they give you, if I want shoes and my shoes small, I get my other one, brother or sister. And, but that's the way. And you know what? I have 13 brother or sister. I think 10 of them really successful. And business and mothers and kids successful and all of them. Our mother also always show us, you can do it. Don't cry. I'm not going to babysit in you. But that's the other mentality. Today, they, we are more strong and tough. And like, for me today, if you ask me, can you, I always tell my kids, if I want today, I'm going to create another business. And I show you that I'm going to be successful. They're always laughing. Yes, I'm going to do it. It's everything the way you decide. It's me. I'm the mirror of myself. It's my decision. If I want to do something, I can do it. But a lot today, first of all, they start, I cannot do it. How I do it? Who's going to do it? No, you can do it. And that's the way I grew up in a house like that. If you want something, you do it. You gotta do it. Now, Aaron, I don't want people to think that you and your brothers are just a household with your mother, but your father is present also. It's, it's very present. And I also don't want people to think that all of a sudden you found hush blankets and you were successful. Like your mother said, no. you had many businesses that you just absolutely failed at. Yeah, I was I was launching, you know, businesses since I was 15 years old, window cleaning, party buses, um, T-shirts. You know, I used to make my mom knit hats and I would sell them in yeah. school. You know, I, I would need three hats. <laughs> Every girl, they come to the mom, these girls have new coats. You have pink, yellow, and this. I want for tomorrow three hats and these colors for the winter. I do it in the night, all the night, give it to him. It was, and uh, then you sell it. Prices, like it's insane. 35 bucks. Then you used to sell hat. Everybody waiting for my hat. No all way. the hockey team used to wait for my hat. Yes, we very... can do it. If they want to do business, we do it. 100%. You know, my, my dad, you know, drove uh, drove a truck and would, you know, deliver 
different food to different grocery stores. You know, we watched him get up every day at 7 a.m. and we'd get back at 8 o'clock and, you know, no real excuses. He would come to our hockey games. Um, he would, you know, make sure he was there for us. And I watched it every day, you know, every single day as a kid, you know, you see my dad, no excuses, never complained, got up, went to work, came back. And then we never once heard him complain. And it was an example for us, you know, knowing that life gets tough at so many times, you know, and so many different times in our lives were challenged. And I always remember him like, he didn't complain for 25 years. And it wasn't until, you know, he had a stroke that really ended it for him and he wasn't able to drive anymore. And it forced us to go and again, start from zero as a family and figure out, all right, what are we going to do now? How do we create another business, which we did together. And it was kind of those lessons, you know, with five boys to watch my mom and my dad, you know, first of all, stay together for, I think it's a 20, 20 year anniversary coming up or 30 year 40. anniversary. Next 30. week we have 40. 40, 40 Aaron. Yeah. <laughs> 40, where have you been? <laughs> 20. I, mean, I wasn't alive that long. <laughs> no, I got to yeah. do this before I let you go because this is so important. And I'm going to let Aaron um, share this quickly before we say goodbye because this has been a wonderful discussion. You know, your mother lost the business through jealousy and pettiness. Talk about what happened to your mother. And even though you had to start all over again, you learned lessons from that also. Aaron. Yeah, you know, I saw from from nothing, her build a magnificent business. And I saw it all kind of go away in a day. And, you know, literally in one day, you know, an article comes out that isn't really true. And it forces the government to just change laws and say, hey, you know, you can't bring girls in anymore. And just overnight, her entire business falls apart. I see people, you know, attack her reputation, you know, make up things. And, you know, you get to watch your mom lose it all, lose 10 years of work in more, 15 years of work in one day. And as traumatic as that is, it really teach, teaches you a lot about life and to be grateful for what we had. And we, we enjoyed every minute of it. And even now at a point in my life where, you know, I still feel I'm getting started, but a lot of people will consider really successful. I don't take it for granted because I know how easy it is at a snap of the finger to go away. And my mom has always been resilient to the point where like, we believe no matter what, we'll figure it out. So every day we still get up, it's still day one for us, but she never gave up and she still took care of herself. She started multiple business since, but it's a super traumatic thing that very few people would not be able to bounce back from losing it all in one day for not doing anything but, but wrong. The, but you show the resilience. So I just, you know, for me, having the mother and the son, which is something rare for us, and have them both on at the same time, celebrating the pitfalls, but yet the triumphs of entrepreneurship. Thank you both so much for joining us. And uh, I'm Armstrong Williams, and we'll be back. It is easier to build up strong children than to try and repair broken men. The streets are plagued with crime, violence, there's a lot of poverty, and it's all a result of lack of education that's happening in our schools. So it really is a crisis. We come from very different political perspectives, but we've come to the same conclusion, and that is there is a crisis in the classroom. Children are being deprived of quality of life because they're being deprived of a good education. We must solve this problem. It's incumbent upon all of us to join hands together to get this done. We can't afford to wait one more day before we address these issues because every day we lose another child. Let's stop the politicking. Let's stop the games. Let's really do something to give these kids a real chance at life and being a part of that American dream. We need accountability for funding. Uh, many of the districts where you're seeing very low test scores, um, you know, students graduating with very low literacy and math comprehension rates, they are receiving a lot of funding. So where is the money going where our kids aren't being adequately educated? 
If you believe every child is deserving of a quality education, please go to educationjusticefoundation.com. C. Derek Cameron is chairman of C LVC Global Holdings, and he joins us, and also a uh, senior service case officer from the CIA who's on some location around the world. You know, uh, let, me, let me start with you, Colonel. What are some of the most promising emerging markets in Africa today, and what, what factors are not only drawing, um, driving their growth, but also crippling their growth. Yeah, absolutely. And we can sector this or segregate this into regions. And I'll talk about West Africa first. Uh, if you look at uh, Ghana, you look at Nigeria, you look at Angola, um, what is interesting about those countries is they have had uh, time to mature in terms of the use, in terms of the um, uh, uh, in terms of the use, in terms of the, the maturation of how they properly exploit their natural resources. They've had a good turn with that in oil, and now they're taking those best practices and using that to properly exploit for the benefit of the people their other natural resources, their critical minerals, their strategic metals, and their precious metals. If you look at South Africa, they've had a long turn in, or the southern part of Af Africa, they've had a lot of experience in terms of dealing with their mining assets, and now they are discovering oil and gas, and so they're going to take those best practices in mining and apply those to the proper exploitation of oil and gas. And if you look at East Africa, they are now relatively new to both of those sectors, but they're using their relationships with their continental partners, again, to, to apply best practices so that they can properly exploit those, those assets that they have. What, what about these countries that are pushing out what was once their partner in the United States? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's very serious. Uh, it is. but and, I, and where Russia is filling the void. Right. So th there are a couple issues here. It's not only Russia. There's also China that is filling that void. Um, and you have to look at this from a couple of perspectives. One is the perspective of the African countries. Um, they would argue probably that they're not pushing the United States out. They would argue that the United States maybe is making it a little difficult for them to uh, do business with. Uh, the Chinese and the Russians, on the other hand, are making it relatively easy to do business with them. Now, that comes with some strings, and some of those strings are really not um, equitable strings that ultimately let the Af their African partners benefit. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, they come in with a more um, open appetite-driven, more partnership-driven type of uh, engagement methodology. And we come in with an old aid mentality-based engagement methodology that we need to quickly change. And once we do that, I think that we will find, uh, if you ask any African country, any African leader, if you ask him, ask them, who would be the partner of choice for you? Is it the Chinese, the Russians, or some other near-peer competitor of the United States? They will pick every time the United States. There's just the, the demand that they have is that, could the United States make it uh, easier uh, more um, flexible in terms of how they engage those countries and let it be partnership-based instead of the old narrative, which is aid-based. Uh, Mr. Operative, how do you respond to what you've heard so far? Yeah, I'm strong. It's a, it's a nice overview, but I work in Africa, and, and it's extremely difficult, and U.S. companies don't have access to that market. The trading, the independent trading sector doesn't have an American-based company anymore. And it is very difficult to break in because the Chinese will buy every every gallon of crude they can find. And the Russians and the Chinese will both deal in whatever currency they want to deal in. And the sanction system that's on the international oil sector limits what an American company can do when they can get into that market. Your response? Um, I work in Africa, too, Africa also, Armstrong. As you know, I've been working in Africa uh, for, for well over 20 years. 
And I would tell you that although he is right, there are, it is difficult from a trading perspective for American companies to get ground. Uh, majors are doing fine. Uh, who, who, who is having trouble is the uh, minor companies or the juniors. And uh, I think sometimes it's their approach. And so not to argue the point with your other guest, but I would say that uh, in spite of the challenges that we have on the ground, we need to be smart about how we uh, engage. And if we can change our narrative and approach, we'll be able to find some, some seams and some gaps in the current status of things that let us exploit opportunities on the continent. Well, it, the, yeah. the, what advice would you give to potential investors mm -hmm. who are considering entering the African market? Find a partner. Number one. And in fact, I'd, I'd make that number two. I'd say go there. Uh, don't don't listen to um, reporting from major uh, audit firms like KPMG and Deloitte. Um, read those. Get as much information as you can. But what you need to do is go on ground. Physically take the business development dollars that you have and go there and meet not only government officials, but meet captains of industry on the ground. That's the first thing you need to do so you understand how the markets work. The second thing I think these companies need to do is once they execute that and they find those partners, engage them. Get a partner on the ground. Be with somebody who can help you from an equitable standpoint, uh, mitigate some of your risk, s share some of your risk and then syndicate in an opportunity with you. I think the sectors that are very good and ripe for that are natural resources, are energy transition uh, issues, are technology opportunities. Those are ripe sectors that I think American companies, particularly small to medium-sized enterprises, if they, if they take a little risk, go there on the ground, get some awareness of the operational slash commercial space, find a good partner, somebody that has access to capital, somebody that also uh, you can get recourse against. I think you'll find that once you make an investment in Africa and the data supports this, uh, you, you get double digit returns. Uh, Mr. Operative, what can we learn from the most recent South African elections? It's a complicating factor on the continent. Yeah, I have a South is. African company and a South African partner. And the fluid nature of what is going on there politically right now, it just tends to muddy things up as the powers that be jockey for position influence and who gets what cut of what industry. So everything is sort of on hold at the moment in South Africa. And I, I have a, we have business partners in uh, several countries and we are limited to get in there. I've yet to stumble onto a major in the area. Nigeria's got some activity, but uh, that's an incredibly complicated place to get energy out of. And most importantly, to get paid. What's one thing to get the get a hold of crude, but then getting it to market and getting paid is a enormous challenge. And if you're not very careful, you can lose your shirt and your company and all your cash. It's just, it's not a, a friendly environment and it is not for the uninitiated to venture in there. And I've been doing it for a long time. Well, as you know, Armstrong, again, I've been in the market for about 20 plus years. I've been in the energy space. I've been in the um, technology space, particularly communications for quite some time, particularly in West Africa. Um, the challenges that your guest is talking about are real and significant, but they're not insurmountable. Um, I know of many companies who have gotten paid in Africa, uh, particularly in Nigeria. Uh, and when you walk in and do this kind of uh, commercial space awareness, um, business development engagement I talked about earlier, one of the things that you have to do is find out how do you get paid, and in each market it's different. For instance, in Nigeria. If you want to get paid in Nigeria, you need to understand that there are five ways to get paid in Nigeria. Usually in the rest of Africa, there are only about three or four. But in Nigeria, you can get paid by the government. You can get paid by a parastatal of the government. There are captains of industry that are both local, national, and or a third country nationals who you can get paid by. And then you can get paid by a multinational. One of the interesting things, you know, a multinational that's operating in that environment. One of the interesting things about Nigeria is you also can engage state governors. There are about five to seven uh, oil and gas states in Nigeria. 
they have their own balance sheet, their own P&L, and you can engage those state governors directly, and that's a fifth way in Nigeria specifically that you can get paid. Some of those challenges that your guests just talked about are significant and real, but you don't enter those markets without your eyes wide open and doing that baseline due diligence of being in the market, getting the right partners who you can get recourse against. I wouldn't engage those markets or any markets in Asia or South America either if you don't do those two initial steps. Uh, this is Star Armstrong. We have a show. Uh, we have our CIA operative on and Colonel Derek Campbell, and we'll be back. As a home buyer, you need a lender who cares about your home ownership dreams. United Security Financial has been helping families secure their dream homes for 30 years. We're a national fair practice lender that provides affordable mortgages and low down payment programs to eligible home buyers. To learn how United Security Financial can help you secure your dream home, call 1-800-373-4186. You know, I don't know how much people follow uh, the news on the continent, but, uh, you know, I read everything. I read books. I read so much. I don't know if people realize that Tissicata and Rwanda, uh, there, was all, there, was a, there was a coup. Mm -hmm. He was almost overthrown. That's right. But he stopped the coup. Mm -hmm. And they have an elections coming up. Mm -hmm. And many people, uh, I don't even think, I, I, I think it's a foregone conclusion with many of the important African nations that they don't want him re-elected. <laughs> Those are how, this is how I read the tea leaves. But let me start with Mr. Operative. How do you read the situation in Rwanda, which also is impacting what's going to go on in the DRC? Oh, yeah. Okay, Mr. Operative? It's a, it's a little bit early to tell who's going to come out on top with this. That is a, it's a complicated environment, at, to say the least. And there's a wait and see attitude from our, certainly from our side, to see what shakes out in, in the coming two, two or three weeks. It'll, the situation will clarify, I think, considerably in a little bit of time, but right now, I, I think it's anybody's guess on who's gonna come out on top. You know, you, know, you know, the thing that's not talked about, which shocks me, you know, they talk about the genocide in Israel, but they don't talk about it in Africa. It, it's there's a there's a lot of strife there. There is some strife. How, how do you? And it's not just their fault. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people that exploit Africa for their resources. Hundred percent. You think about the number of heads of state on the continent that have been assassinated because they decided they were going to do their own bidding, do what's best interest in their own country, and somebody from the Belgians or the French or somebody decided to take them out. That's right. This is a fact. That's a fact. It's a reality that we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. Has that ever changed? Because you talked about their being able to exploit their resources, which are critical, but, but they're exploited by other countries, their leadership. Mm -hmm. They're not always fully in control. Sure, that's right. That's right. Well, I would say this. Um, I think this new generation, this new era of African leaders has had it up to here with that. Mm -hmm. uh, there is strife on the continent. As you know, I was the chief of military plans in South Sudan during one of their civil war periods, internal civil war periods. You're right, the amount of genocide and mass atrocity events that were happening there were, were uh, it, it was unimaginable. But again, a lot of that circled around not just tribal issues, but it was about who would control the natural yeah, resources. That's what it's about. And at the end of the day, and some of that had external influence, some of it was all internal, and that's just one vignette. Uh, at the end of the day, this is where I think um, members of the African Union are because it's such a uh, visceral topic for them at this state of the game. Uh, it is talked about by Afro-Exim Bank, African Development Bank, African Finance Corporation, the, the, the uh, African Union, ECOWAS, and then the other regional commercial blocks like SADC and, and COMISA, that it is time for the Africans to become a first world uh, order. Again, not order, but first world, first world nations across the continent. And the only way that they're gonna be able to do that is to collaborate, collaborate on issues of, of competitiveness, collaborate on issues of 
proper um, exploitation. Uh, and I underline the proper there, proper exploitation of their natural resources so that they can do what? Create jobs, create a commercial base uh, that lets them need not, not only have influence on how they want to change their societies at the nascent level, at the, uh, at, the, uh, at the state level, but also on the international scene. As you know, because of those issues that you talked about with strife, with atrocity events with genocide, the narrative on Africa is terrible, right? The narrative about safety in Africa, the narrative about business in Africa, the narrative about African people. But when you go on the continent, that narrative that we hear in the West, you see so many contradictions of that, you almost have to say to yourself, well, why are we getting uh, told this bad bill of goods? Because just as you talk about some of the challenges that exist for American businesses, for Western businesses, for international investors. There are success stories on that continent that are not being told. When you talk about, when your guest talked about the challenges he's had about getting paid, there are numerous companies that do get paid, that make millions and millions of dollars in Nigeria, in Ghana, in Angola, in Kenya, right? So the issue is we now have to change that narrative. Um, and the way to do that is for the Africans to take control of their own narrative. And how do you do that? Talk about the success stories. Talk about the fact that safety is an issue and they're doing things to help safety across the continent. Talk about the, go talk about the fact that governance and, and good commercial laws are issues that they talk about and that they implement so that there, are e it, there is ease of doing business across all nations on the continent. Some of that is not getting the right kind of fanfare or billing, uh, um, international billing, so that there can be a change in this narrative uh, in, in the West. But I think they understand that they need to make that, that play. They need to start articulating in, in really robust fashion about the, the, the positive things that are happening on the continent. And then once that happens, you'll get the capital markets in the West to start to take a real good eye at Africa. Because fundamentally, when you look at major investments that are made on the continent, you get double-digit returns, and that's indisputable. You, you know, Mr. Operative, um, do, do you think that the United States, um, because of its neglect of Africa, its refusal to invest, and also, you know, under President Obama, we tried to f uh, force our values upon these African leaders when it comes to LBGTQ, which is not going to happen in Africa. It's just not going to happen. Correct. Uh, they have their own identity, and there's just some things they're not going to accept. How can the United States be a better partner on the continent, Mr. Operative? That's a, a huge, complicated question, Armstrong. It's a very good question because there, there's a disconnect with what is actually going on on the ground and how American companies who are completely commercial, have no connection to the United States government at all, and are working in these areas, the margin is something that you had to deal with, and you gotta, you gotta measure it literally in fractions of a dollar at some times, and the margin that you can end up with is so tight that you take an enormous amount of risk, you lose one cargo, you've lost everything. There, are, The Colonel's right, there are people making money there, but I don't know of any American companies that are there, and we're on the ground. I just don't stumble onto any Americans. There's enormous numbers of Chinese on the ground in East Africa and West Africa. They've set up operation centers on the ground. They, they vacuum up all email conversation, push and talk radios, everything. They're not on satellite systems, they're on local networks. They have a pretty good picture of what's going on inside the country and who's who. And you just don't stumble onto American business people there. And we haven't left because we're, we're giving up. We've just looked in other areas because you've got to mitigate your own risk. And if you get some of that oil, it's very difficult to sell it. You have to get it somewhere. And you've got a long ride to a refinery if you're coming out of East Africa. If you're coming out of the Middle East, the ride is shorter, the tanker ride is shorter. And even though the Middle East is much more complicated in certain areas, you can you can still make money in the Middle East. And you can, you've got a relatively short shipping window and you're in a cor corridor where you can go to Asia with relative ease. 
The Indians are always looking for, for crude. Other parts of Asia are looking for crude. And you have a refinery that you can get to. What Africa, there's a disconnect. At least it's just my let me, let me Let me get um, the colonel to talk about the meaning of the end of the petrodollar agreement. Okay. How significant is that? Uh, let me go back for a second, if you don't mind. because we, we have a minute 30. A minute 30 seconds. I, I would just add to the point that your uh, guest made that um, if you look at West Africa and the number of oil producing states there, uh, countries there that deliver crude to the United States, it's an exceptional number and they've been doing it for quite some time and they do that because it's much easier to get crude out of West Africa than it is the Middle East. Just the transit times alone, you can look at a map and you can see that. Um, and so I don't necessarily share all of the views that your guest has about the challenges in Africa because I know many American businesses, we know them, Microsoft, Oracle, ExxonMobil, Shell, et cetera, you can, you can go on. They're mostly majors. I think it's time the for the. Uh, I think Agreed. it's time for the miners to get an opportunity to go there, and the issue about the petrodollar, uh, th that's all good discussion, that's all great talk. Um, we have a long way to go before the petrodollar becomes um, a challenge to the U.S. dollar's preeminence on the continent of Africa. We and agree, so, and okay. so I think yeah. uh, at the end of the day, um, although that might be great talk. And, and something that actually might be good aspirationally for Africans, but at the end of the day, and, and, and the emerging and frontier markets writ large, but I think at the end of the day, um, one of the fundamental uh, things about um, the way that we do business, the United States does business, is that we need to take advantage of really our hegemonic um, preeminence on the and continent. we are out of time. Okay, I cannot thank you enough for what you do, sure. Mr. Operative. The Spavix in Toronto. I'm Armstrong Williams. Have a good day. Yeah. Thank you. Armstrong. Take care now. Yes.